Uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining this evening's Urban Design Committee event. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'd like to just let you know about some of the upcoming events that we have. Come, that we have. In October, we will have Gabrielle Bullock from Perkins and Will uh, discussing uh, the issues of diversity within our profession and specifically the Perkins Will's Destination Crenshaw Project which is scheduled for completion, I think, in 2021. Uh, and then in November, uh, we'll have uh, the firm Brooks plus Scarpa present their NEST project, uh, which deals with infill housing, something that we, you know, all of us are very well focused on. And I know Christopher is going to be discussing that very topic this evening. Uh, and then in December, we were planning on an event, but it's still a work in progress. So uh, by next month, we should have that sorted out. Uh, some basic ground rules for this evening's chat. Uh, please mute your audio. Uh, the presentation will run approximately 40 minutes uh, with some Q&A afterward. Uh, so if you guys have questions, if people have questions, please submit them to the chat room to, and I don't think you have an option, you just submit it to everyone. Um, and then Tibby, please hit the record button. Just a reminder, hit that, hit that button. Anyway, our guest this evening is Christopher Hawthorne. Uh, Christopher grew up in Berkeley and attended Yale, where he received a degree in political science and architectural history. He's an author, professor, journalist, and documentarian. And from 2004 to 2018 was the architecture critic for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, in 2018, Mayor Garcetti created the chief design officer position to which uh, Christopher was appointed. So please welcome LA's first chief design officer, Christopher Hawthorne. Chris, take it away. Thanks so much, Tony. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Uh, yeah, uh-huh. Perfect. Um, thanks so much. Thanks to Diane. Thanks to Tibby. Thanks to everybody at the chapter. It's really a pleasure. And thanks to everyone who's here for spending um, a good chunk of your Thursday evening with us. I know Zoom fatigue is a real thing. Um, and I really appreciate you ending your day um, with us to, to talk about housing and in particular to talk about a design competition or a design challenge as we may end up calling it. And I'll talk a little bit about um, that distinction uh, a little bit later on. Um, and more broadly about how we think about the future of single family neighborhoods and low rise sections of the city uh moving forward so i'll get started so as um, as as Tony mentioned on the top 35 or 40 minutes um and uh happy to take questions and really i'm, I'm most interested in in there's a um, as a conversation with all of you, um, we are in the, in the, let's say, the engagement phase of this competition, and we will be um, uh, launching it uh, in the second half of October, but we're doing some formal engagement sessions, which I'll talk about, but, but I think of this as part of that conversation and, and really are, are really interested in hearing your thoughts, particularly the relationship given the focus of this committee between urban design and um, uh, and residential architecture in our single family and low rise, um, low rise neighborhoods. Um, so I'll start my images. All right, is everybody able to see that? You can see it, Chris. Okay, perfect. So, 
I won't have to tell a, a, a group of architects that um, the shadow that's cast by the single family house and in particular the glamour of particular examples, uh, particularly in the modernist idiom, um, that, that shadow is quite a substantial one in terms of um, how we think about not just architecture in Los Angeles, housing, residential architecture, but really the civic identity of Los Angeles. There is a, such a power to these projects and images um, that there is a view, I think that Los Angeles in, in some circles is understood as being represented by the single family house. And I wanna talk about a little bit uh, tonight, the, the kind of limits of that point of view and how that's, um, how critique of that notion is informing some of the work that we're doing. Hey, Chris, um, Chris yeah. I'm so sorry mm -hmm. to interrupt you. But did you turn your video off deliberately to help your audio? Because we can't, I'm not seeing you. I didn't turn off. It's because I'm sh just because I'm sharing my screen. Okay, you can leave your video on if you want. If you're concerned about um, your your upload and download time, I understand. But you can share no, it's, your it's, and, Yeah. It's, um, I'm going to pause the share. So to be my video is on. It's just the the um, when I'm sharing my screen, you won't see my video just because of the way Zoom works on my computer. You're good, Christopher. Keep on rolling. Uh, the audio is your audio is good right now too. So. Okay, great. Okay, so um, uh, there's really a kind of secret history, not secret to architects, of course, but I think secret to the general public of innovation in Los Angeles residential architecture that lives in a uh, low rise residential scale, but is um, at, at some density past the single family house. So uh, if you think about the um, Koning Eisenberg Hollywood duplex from the 1980s, even some of the Think about the Eames uh, House and Studio. It really relies for its kind of architectural um, sensibility on the existence of the studio and the kind of relationship between um, the house and the and the sort of work unit or the or the main and, and secondary unit. Similarly, the the two four six eight house, the Morphosis um, uh, project in Venice, is um, an early experiment in in what we now think of as ADU design. And of course, of course, the Schindler House on Kings Road designed not just for two families, but kind of an, as an experiment or an essay in, in, uh, in sharing uh, residential space. Even the case study program, as many of you will know, did include in its latter years a couple of multifamily experiments, uh, one of which was built um, uh, in, in Arizona, this project by Alfred Beadle, um, and another multifamily project by Ed Killingsworth. Um, was also part of the program. But going back much further than that, of course, um, there's ex really rich legacy of experimentation, innovation, and a combination of pragmatism and, and forward-looking architecture in uh, one and two-story multi-unit projects that were very close to the ground that took advantage of connections to landscape and climate in Los Angeles, but nonetheless built at a, at a density significantly beyond what became sort of paradigmatic in the mid-century period with the, with the case study program in, in terms of the single family house and its sort of hold on the popular imagination, as I mentioned. In recent years, there have been some policy shifts to try to um, enable that kind of construction. Of course, the small lot subdivision ordinance uh, has produced some really uh, successful architectural results, including uh, Barbara Bester's Blackbirds project um, from five years ago, but this, of course, uh, only applies small lot subdivision ordinance in multifamily neighborhoods and, and, and didn't have any effect on what was happening in, in single family neighborhoods across Los Angeles. Of course, in recent years, we've, we've also become, begun to realize the extent to which we really need to reckon with histories of racial exclusion, uh, racist lending and land use policies that in Los Angeles, as in so many 
cities across the country really uh, made the kind of wealth building that is possible in the United States thanks to tax law and other incentives through home ownership made it accessible and available um, almost exclusively to white home buyers. And the scholarship that has um, brought those questions to the fore, I think, has really changed the conversation. And, and I hope it's changing the conversation in architecture and planning schools. For example, when I was studying architectural history, we learned about case study or the GI Bill, for example, there was no discussion of the relationship between those kinds of programs and their architecture and uh, redlining, for example, or the ways in which the GI Bill in practice was really accessible only to white home buyers across the country. What we learned about only a generation ago as a, a kind of force for democratization, of course, now we realize, um, uh, and many have realized for a long time that the the, the the truth and the history is much more complicated. Nonetheless, a huge uh, majority of the buildable residential area in Los Angeles remains zoned single family. If you take into account low rise neighborhoods, so single family and one and two story fabric, multifamily neighborhoods, you're talking about in excess of 80% of the buildable land in Los Angeles. Um, and so it's really clear that the, uh, any debate about uh, densification, housing affordability, home, new path to home ownership, et cetera, will, will have to take on this territory. And it's been really, really difficult politically and otherwise for some reasons that we'll get into um, to, uh, to have a conversation about what we want the future of single family neighborhoods to look like with the exception of a kind of reactive conversation every time new housing legislation is proposed in Sacramento that might affect that territory. So um, SB 50, SB 27, more recently SB 1120, the Senate bill that would have allowed lots to be split and duplexes to be built in single family neighborhoods on smaller minimum lot sizes. Um, those kinds of proposals from Sacramento have produced of course a reaction in Los Angeles, but we have, what we have been lacking in my view, is a conversation, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, uh, about the future of this territory that has really been organic to Los Angeles that, that starts here and is connected to uh, discussions that are happening, of course, all around the city in these neighborhoods. And of course, um, all single family neighborhoods were not uh, created equal either. It's really important to keep that in mind. So the question is not only how we can uh, think about new uh, housing typologies and opening up new paths to affordability and home ownership in this territory, uh, but also the, the kinds of distinctions among and between these territories because of the legacies of, of redlining. It was just a, a very extensive study published in the New York Times about um, redlining and its effects on um, uh, on temperatures in, in neighborhoods that had been redlined or hadn't. So if you look down toward the bottom of this chart, you'll see Los Angeles, and here it is zoomed in a little bit. So the green at far left is the neighborhoods that were, that were, um, that were deemed um, most desirable uh, by lending and in the sort of redlining regime and available, of course, almost exclusively to white home buyers, where today you have temperatures that are more than five degrees cooler on, uh, on average. And if you look at the right neighborhoods that were deemed undesirable, uh, uh, now significantly warmer than the average. So it's also about how we open up opportunities in the neighborhoods that um, um, not only have been um, the recipients of, of particular kinds of architecture over the years, but, but also bear a kind of environmental and climate uh, benefits of, of the legacies of redlining. That's something that I think cities are just beginning to grapple with in terms of this connection to climate change. So the debates about um, uh, new housing policy in this territory at the state level, of course, go back to the 1980s when the first ADU debates were happening, but they really accelerated in January of, 197, uh, January of 2017, pardon me, when SB 1069 and some other new, new um, legislation went into effect statewide, which really um, um, helped streamline and promote the production of ADUs. And we saw in Los Angeles, uh, after that legislation went into effect, uh, just a, um, a exponential rise in the number of, uh, of permit applications and ultimately construction of ADUs across the city. If you look at the uh, difference between 2016 and 2017, uh, more than a tenfold 
uh, a jump in, in, in permit applications for ADUs. And we have seen that growth just continue. This is uh, uh, part of the dashboard that you can find on the city planning department um, uh, housing section. And the ADUs have consistently been the last several years about 20% of our housing production across the city. So one in five new units happening in backyards at the scale that we're talking about. On the other end of the scale, the most significant policy change that we have made in Los Angeles over the last several years is the Transit-Oriented Communities Program, which was enabled by Measure JJJ, uh, which uh, allowed construction uh, density bonuses and other incentives for the construction of uh, residential multifamily buildings near transit. Um, and, and this is the version of that dashboard page for, for TOC. What we haven't seen is anything in between. There's a lot of territory. There's a lot of space to cover in between those two poles, um, sometimes described as the kind of missing middle, although that phrase missing middle has uh, different meanings, whether you're talking to a group of architects or a group of housing experts who are thinking about affordability and income. So we are getting ready to launch next month um, what uh, a project that I've spoken with many of you about over the last year or so um, that will look at this low rise fabric. And you'll see at the top here that we uh, may not call it a design competition at all right now, the language which is subject to some change based on these some uh, engagement sessions that I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we're calling it a design challenge for now. And it really looks at what the next step is after ADUs in this low rise single family and low rise um, housing uh, residential zones across the city. So after we have either a second unit or now there's a kind of junior ADU or a third unit that's enabled um, by AB 1068, which um, allows a smaller third, a second ADU or a third uh, residential unit. But the question of what comes next, what fills this gap or this donut hole in the policy between ADUs on one end and TOC on the other is a significant question, particularly if we're looking at single family neighborhoods. So this is an effort that's part of a larger research initiative um, that we're working on in collaboration with uh, Deputy Mayor Miguel Sangalang, who oversees the Mayor's Office of Budget and Innovation and several of his colleagues along with the Urban Institute, we have support from the Irvine Foundation, Department of Water and Power, and other partners to, to fund this uh, design challenge or competition. And again, it's really important that this be an initiative um, and a process that is organic to, that is specific to, that grows out of Los Angeles and the concerns um, that Angelinos have about the future of these low-rise neighborhoods. And that also looks back as I mentioned to the particular history of innovation that we have at precisely this scale in Los Angeles's architectural and, and, and urban past. So the goal is to launch it in the second half of October. And the message we will be sending in the competition brief in ways that I'll get into shortly is really that this is not a typical design competition. It's not about the imposition of, of form making um, on the communities of Los Angeles. It has a much different set I have priorities and I want to talk a little bit about how we how we set those priorities. So why look at this territory? So we'd be looking essentially essentially at three to eight units um, across one to two uh, kind of traditionally sized residential lots of um, uh, let's say 50 by 150 feet as a kind of uh, basic building block of low rise neighborhoods. Uh, we know that on a per unit basis, these are significantly cheaper to build than any other options except for, it's important to note, subdividing existing single family houses, and that will be something we look at in this design challenge. Um, but uh, one and two story conventional construction without parking um, in one recent McKenzie study was pegged at less than $200,000 a unit, which for those of you who have watched the prices for um, affordable housing in Los Angeles uh, grow past half a million dollars per unit is a strikingly low figure. We also want to test um, in this initiative an idea that this scale might offer, and there is not great research on this question at the moment, but we're very interested in helping further the answers to these questions, whether this scale does offer a greater degree of agency or self-determination for existing communities um, in single family and low rise neighborhoods than let's say the taller or denser options that would have been enabled by 
SB 50, for example, at, at, uh, at three, four stories or even higher. Um, so there is some evidence and, and certainly anecdotally a lot of sense that um, this might be a scale that would offer more uh, agency for existing homeowners, renters, uh, and residents of these neighborhoods. So as I mentioned, and this is a really key point, one of the ways that we're um, uh, ensuring, we hope that this will not be a typical design competition, is that we are doing some pretty, pretty extensive community engagement, and it's been really spearheaded um, by my colleague Alejandro Gonzalez, who I think is with us this evening, who is a David Bonet Foundation Fellow in the Mayor's Office and a student at Luskin at UCLA and has been uh, really spearheading this part of the initiative. And we have been planning five what we're calling listening sessions uh, with community partners who are working on housing um, and thinking about precisely this scale and more to the point hearing from their members and their partners uh, and their colleagues um, and their allies in this work, uh, concerns, aspirations, um, anxieties and hopes about where these neighborhoods uh, will go, how they will evolve. So we have five listening sessions planned between now and early October, and I'll take you through specifically what those sessions are looking like. We will record those sessions. We will add the recordings of those sessions to the competition or design challenge site. They will be summarized in the brief. And again, that will um, make sure to send a clear message that any architects who are entering this competition will uh, really need to ground themselves in the way that these issues are playing out on the ground in Los Angeles um, and in neighborhoods and really uh, uh, have some exposure to the diversity, the breadth of opinion on this question of the kind of uh, uh, new housing typologies that right, really bring benefits to communities. So again, we're hoping that architects and, and, and we want landscape architects to be part of this process as well to submit proposals that really do reflect the kind of community discussion that's happening and that we'll be hearing in these uh, listening sessions, uh, reflecting that aspiration anxiety and to fill what I really see as a vacuum of information. There have not been, in my view, enough architectural proposals. We've had a lot of policy discussion about where this, uh, where zoning in these neighborhoods might go, again, mostly originating in Sacramento. What we have lacked is some proposals in the way that the case study program did provide, whatever we see as its faults now, did provide very specific um, architectural ideas to which people could attach their aspirations and anxieties about how they wanted to live in the post-war city of Los Angeles. And we have had a vacuum of architectural information that it seems to me has been filled with um, some uh, some fear, some scaremongering uh, tactics, but uh, it has not uh, been filled with the kind of architectural intelligence that we're hoping um, to, uh, to, to, to ask architects participating in this project to, to help us with. And it's also important to say that, that unlike case study, we do not see these as, as uh, uh, what will come out of this uh, design challenge as models, sort of platonic models of, of 21st century living but as a way rather to advance the conversation, um, uh, something that, the, that communities can attach a richer conversation to, they can respond to, they can use it as a means of, of moving that conversation forward. It's important to say that the cities that have seen significant uh, reform in, um, in zoning and land use in low rise and single family neighborhoods and Minneapolis and Portland are the two examples that many of you listening this evening will be familiar with, um, had many, many years of engagement that was deeply local um, of the kind that we have lacked in Los Angeles, at least as organized by the city, before they could take these questions to the city council, before they turned into housing policy. Um, and so I think it's important to be humble about this and say from the point of view of Los Angeles, despite the absolute crushing pressure of the housing affordability and homelessness crisis, we are at the beginning of a process that is complicated, um, is multi-year, and Minneapolis and Portland, if anything, are more um, uh, in, their, in their political culture, more homogenous, um, more uniform in their politics uh, than Los Angeles. And so it may be a conversation that frankly is more difficult and more complex in Los Angeles, and that's something we need to acknowledge at the beginning as well. So. This text may be a bit small, I apologize if you're not able to read it, but I'll just take you through very quickly. These are the five listening sessions that we have planned beginning next week and, and extending through October 3rd. 
Uh, they're organized thematically. Our original hope was to do them geographically, but we just realized that it made a lot more sense to do them uh, organized by theme. So um, we will um, uh, look at transformative climate communities and the two groups, Pacoima Beautiful and the Watts Rising Collaborative that have received state funding through the TCC program uh, in a conversation facilitated by Adonia Lugo. Um, the second will be on the theme of public infrastructure investment and the ripple effects that that might have uh, and fears about ripple effects that it might have on um, housing affordability, displacement, gentrification in surrounding communities. So Tony was mentioning uh, Destination Crenshaw as coming up on the agenda for, uh, for this committee. We will have representatives uh, from that effort, from ACT LA, uh, perhaps one other uh, facilitated by David Levitas, really thinking about the ways in which um, open space investment, infrastructure investment, um, is largely seen in many communities that are under pressure of displacement as being something that may accelerate that kind of unwelcome change. And as that is related to housing policy, we think that's an important conversation to have. Um, the third is on community land trust and cooperative housing models uh, with Trust South LA, um, a new group called the Community Power Collective, the Beverly Vermont Community Land Trust, El Sereno Community Land Trust, uh, facilitated by uh, I think the, the leading expert in community land trust uh, work in Los Angeles, Sandra McNeil. Uh, and in that case, we'll be really thinking about the new models of shared space. Uh, one of the lessons that we need to relearn in Los Angeles as we move past a sort of single family um, uh, hegemony is, is about how to share architectural and residential space, whether it's indoor or outdoor more effectively and looking for new architectural models that will help facilitate the kind of sharing of space that we're seeing develop from a policy point of view and a land use point of view in the community land trust models. Fourth is really looking at some affordable housing models and community response, um, which will include discussion of homelessness as well, um, including uh, representatives from LA Family Housing, the Venice Community Housing Group, um, uh, works and that is facilitated by uh, Helen Learn of LA Moss and our um, and our City Planning Commission. And finally, looking at sustainability um, with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance. Uh, I mentioned that we have support from uh, LADWP. There's really striking research now that suggests that a well-designed and thoughtfully arranged fourplex, for example, on a traditional single-family lot can use less water, less energy, have a smaller carbon footprint than a, than a traditional single family house. Um, and we also need to be thinking, as I'll mention in a bit, about sustainability at the macro level. Um, and so that's an important theme in this conversation as well. So here's some of the major themes that we're hoping will sort of cut through um, and connect um, all of the conversations. One is that we really see a role for architecture and design here to help break the ice and move this discussion forward. So if you think about where the conversation from a policy point of view has been in the city, we've had proposals from Sacramento like SB 50. They have been opposed um, almost without fail um, in, unanimously by our city council. So there has not even been space for a real conversation um, at that level about, um, about where policy might go. And I think, again, that's largely because we have not had this conversation, which has been organic to Los Angeles. And it's also important that architects help us illustrate the benefits to communities that new models of multifamily living and low-rise territory might enable. So that might include aging in place. That might mean, you know, this has been absolutely affected um, by the pandemic, thinking about space to quarantine or the appeal of well-designed shared outdoor space, given that that's where we're spending so much of our time when we are able to socialize with folks outside of our households. It really is in well-designed shared outdoor space. The question of supporting neighborhood walkability through slightly higher levels of density and how we might enable a kind of culture of walkability and move toward the kind of 15 or 20 minute city that planners are talking about uh, so much these days in relation to the post pandemic um, uh, city. We have found that it's much more effective and useful and I think productive, frankly, to talk about flexibility um, in terms of, instead of density per se, which is to say, 
it's really difficult to argue with the notion that our single family zoning has become quite rigid and ADUs have been one new major new means of flexibility. Uh, but to, the, to, to a large extent, the single family zones have become quite rigid. They don't offer the kind of abilities to age in place, ability for younger residents who have grown up in neighborhoods to, to buy in or come back as renters in the neighborhoods where they grew up. So we think architecture, again, has a role in, uh, to play here in illustrating the kind of flexibility that might be enabled by some new housing models that, that um, take us past the second or third unit in single family zones. I mentioned sustainability. It's really important to think of this in both macro and micro terms. So the, the, the wildfires this summer have really clarified um, the need for us to pull back uh, from the so-called uh, wild, wildlife urban interface and, and, and think about infill development more intelligently. Then their question is, where does that infill go? Um, and that's what this kind of design challenge is really uh, meant to explore. I haven't talked about the kind of SCAG regional housing targets that also really are pushing finally um, in, in, a, in a much more enlightened way, uh, calling for, for new infill residential development to be happening near the coast and away from um, areas of extreme heat and extreme wildfire risk um, and in areas that promote sprawl and automobile use. And it's important to think again about um, the vast territory that is low rise in terms of its zoning, thinking about the dramatic need to pull back from the edge of housing production uh, in the metropolitan region and think about where new housing can go closer to transit, closer to the coast. And then also in micro terms, I mentioned the ability perhaps for a well-designed fourplex to use less energy, less water, pr produce uh, a model of an electric kitchen, for example, all the kinds of modeling of sustainability that, that we think could be very effective. Um, and a final point to keep in mind is that in the long view of Los Angeles architecture, and that's one of the reasons I started with these other examples, going back to bungalow courts, going back to Irving Gill, um, is that the single family house is not the eternal condition, despite the kind of still very stubborn tropes uh, and stereotypes of Los Angeles, despite the power of, of uh, case study imagery, Julia Shulman photographs and all the rest, um, but it's perhaps the anomaly, which is to say we had a, we had a period of uh, producing a really rich variety of, uh, of architecture at this scale that, that included many experiments in multifamily at one and two stories. And we need to be moving into a period where we again embrace a rich variety um, of housing types in this territory. And I think as we look back uh, with the perspective of a longer view of history, it will, it will uh, um, eventually become apparent that the house again, is not a fixed characteristic of Los Angeles, the single family detached house with lawn and swimming pool, but in fact, an anomaly that was absolutely the product of federal, um, uh, federal policy that included the expansion of the freeway network um, that provided access to single family subdivisions, um, the uh, mortgage deduction, the kinds of lending practices that I talked about earlier. And the question for this particular group, and I really am, am very interested for comments and questions around this set of questions, given that this is the Urban Design Committee uh, of the chapter, how do we think about the relationship between low-rise housing typologies and urban design? And how can the brief that we're finalizing over the next uh, few weeks best explore that relationship? And I'll end as a kind of, um, a way to, 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 to kickstart that conversation with, with again, two examples, uh, architectural examples. This is from the Twitter feed, and I, I hate to call out this particular Twitter user, but from Minneapolis housing proponent, a Yimby in Portland of a kind of sixplex that he calls out as his favorite uh, new version. All the architects, I think, on the call are, are finding all the ways that this project is probably not ideal, um, even just starting with little details like the, the top of the door frame not lining up with the window, um, the, the ways in which um, the approach to the street, all of the density is right on the sidewalk uh, with no attempt to modulate it, no attempt to uh, give every unit immediate access to the landscape, the outdoors, uh, any private garden space that's not um, on display from the front of the property. So this elevation gives you a sense of just the kind of most expedient way of adding density. Um, and this is the kind of thing that housing advocates often cheer. And I think residents of neighborhoods uh, rightly are 
a bit anxious about. They wonder about a neighborhood made up of projects that look just like this. And compare that, again, unfair to the anonymous designer of what I just showed you, but if you think about the Gill project that I mentioned, Horatio West Court in Santa Monica, in Ocean Park, 1919, six units, again, six units, roughly the same scale, roughly the same density, but ar arranged in such a more thoughtful way in terms of its address to the street, its approach to the street, um, its relationship to the sidewalk, its relationship uh, between each, the relation between each unit and the, and, and the landscape, the out of doors, um, the way that the scale is broken down, the way that everybody has a, a kind of sense that they have um, a series of thresholds that are very thoughtfully designed. I think this will be very important in this design challenge between uh, inside and out, between fully private, semi-private, semi-public, fully public space. And it's really up to architects and landscape architects to help us uh, think about that, that set of questions. It, here's a, um, a way for you to understand the plan. This is six units um, with a, a drive through the center here, two smaller units at rear, four larger units toward the front. Again, every unit has this kind of immediate access to the outdoors. Um, and it's really solutions that are thoughtful in this kind of a way that we're hoping uh, that we're hoping for. So what I will say in closing, I, uh, as I start my share, is that um, the, uh, the, the, the categories really are um, uh, open to change as we have these listening sessions. They, they, we really want to make sure that um, this community engagement that we're doing really does inform the, the brief. Um, and we want to um, uh, make sure that all the competitors, again, are listening to this question of um, thinking about this question of the breadth of and diversity of opinion across Los Angeles about um, what changes to uh, levels of density and housing policy land use might mean for their neighborhoods, but as we're thinking of it, uh, of it now, we're thinking of four categories um, uh, that we'll ask uh, entrants to think about. And we have, again, we have, it's not a traditional design competition, but we do have, we do have uh, uh, prize money in each of the four categories. Um, bear with me for one second. Um, so those categories would be a ground up fourplex, thinking about how to arrange four units um, across a traditional sort of 7,500 7,500 foot lot. Um, second would be subdividing a single family house. And that can be tough to demonstrate within the language of a competition, but we're interested in maybe taking some landmark or famous uh, single family houses and asking um, entrants to subdivide them. So that could be, you know, the stall house, one of the case study houses or the Eames house or the mayor's house if he'll, if he'll let us or one of the Frank Lloyd Wright houses in Los Angeles. Um, Houses that architects know where the plans are available, they can really think about how they might be sliced up or even distributed across the site. Um, we think that that, that will be a, a, um, a category that folks can have fun with. Uh, the third would be some version of thinking about smaller minimum lot sizes and, and the kinds of changes that SB 1120 contemplated. Um, uh, before it died a very slow death in Sacramento, that is to say, could you subdivide a single family lot um, and build a freestanding single family house or duplex on, um, uh, on a small, smaller lot? And what would that mean in terms of lot coverage, in terms of landscape, again, in terms of relationship to the street, urban design? And then a fourth category, uh, finally, which would do the opposite, which is to say, um, allow two homeowners, um, uh, perhaps at the corner of adjoining uh, lots to combine their lots and build six to eight units across two lots. Um, that would again require some very thoughtful and, and, and smart thinking about landscape, about shared space, about the approach um, to the public realm, the public right of way. Um, it's likely, I think, that that will include some um, uh, encouragement for the competitors to think about small scale retail, the reintroduction of a small corner store, for example, that might support the kind of walkability that I was talking about before. Um, and, uh, and, and, and it's really there where you can get, I think, the clearest picture of the kind of flexibility I was talking about. So if you imagine six to eight units across two lots, um, 
you know, a couple of which could be larger units that were primary residences, and then others that could be used in a whole flexible range um, uh, of ways, whether that's live work, rental units, uh, quarantine units, granny flats, literal granny flats for, uh, for aging in place or places for younger um, uh, residents who grew up in neighborhoods to come back again to find a kind of foothold. Um, as renters. And the last thing I'll say, and I'm, I'm very eager to hear your thoughts and questions as we move to that portion of the program, um, is again, this is part of a larger uh, research initiative that my colleagues in other parts of the mayor's office are pursuing in collaboration with the Urban Institute and other partners. And, and that will really focus on uh, the financing, the lending, the new path to home ownership, the kind of financial uh, piece of this, and we hope that as as we sort of um, go out first in this initiative, that the architectural ideas that we come back with will again inform not just community conversations going forward, but also help us imagine new ways to think about past affordability. Um, because there really is a tension in the way that we have zoned this land and the way people uh, use it. You know, we have in Los Angeles, just again, contrary to uh, stereotype and contrary, I think, to popular opinion in most of Los Angeles, we have one of the highest proportions of rental households in the country. Um, we hover around the top four or five, uh, something like two thirds of um, Angelinos or renters in a city, as I mentioned, that is zoned predominantly single family still. Um, so that's one of those places where concerns about what any changes will mean in terms of displacement are really acutely felt if you think about the tenuous nature uh, of, of renting now, uh, particularly given this economic crisis that's been brought on by the pandemic. Um, and so again, this is a much more diverse uh, landscape in almost every way you can think of. The, the makeup of renters and homeowners, those who really would welcome some changes, those who are anxious about those changes. Um, and we really find that despite the kind of narrative that you often hear in the media or in discussions of housing policy of a huge gulf and polarization between NIMBYs on one end and NIMBYs on the other, that in fact, most folks that we talk to, and we'll see as we test this out in this listening sessions where this is true of the folks who are participating in these conversations, um, most folks are in the middle. Most folks um, realize that this is not a sustainable land use model, especially given climate change, especially given the histories of redlining and exclusive, uh, racially uh, restrictive lending and zoning practices, but they have reasonable, legitimate, understandable concerns about what any change in their neighborhood would mean for what their community feels like, um, whether it would accelerate displacement, speculation from outside investment, et cetera. So we're trying in this process to meet folks where they are, and we think where they are is in the middle of that conversation rather than on one end or the other. So I'll leave it there. Thanks so much for your attention. I apologize for any technical hiccups and I look forward to uh, the conversation. Thank you. Thanks, Christopher, for, uh, for that presentation. I, I, we've got some questions, a couple of questions coming in. We've got a lot of people here, so I expect that we'll have uh, a bunch. Uh, I, have, I have a question though, just with respect to the position of the chief design officer. This is a new position. Uh, we've not had this before. Can you describe, you know, in addition to your getting in, you know, into involved in specific issues related to housing, what the overarching mission is of the position and help explain that to the committee, please? Absolutely, absolutely. So this really grew, the position really grew out of a series of conversations that I had with Mayor Garcetti. Um, that actually have their roots in the AIA event. Um, so during the mayoral campaign of 2013, when I was architecture critic at the Times, um, the AIA, this chapter put together a, a series of mayoral forums, discussions with all of the mayoral candidates. These were not debates. Um, these were conversations that Bill Roshan, who was then the president of the Planning Commission and I moderated with each of the um, uh, candidates for mayor in turn. So we did about a half dozen. That was the year um, many of you will recall when Austin Butner was a candidate for mayor. He later became publisher of the LA Times before going on to LAUSD, of course. Wendy Gruel, Jan Perry, Kevin James, now a colleague of mine in City Hall. 
and of course then council president Eric Garcetti. And it was clear in that conversation, uh, first of all, that that the mayor that Garcetti was going to win, um, he was well, he was poised to win that election, and also that he had a really unusual interest in and uh, knowledge of sophistication about the subjects that I have spent a career thinking and writing about architecture, urban design, planning, et cetera. Um, and it was a very rich discussion. And after he was elected, he reached out to me and asked if we could do it again, uh, somewhat uh, longer conversation. And we did that at Occidental College um, in 2014 after he was elected. And then when he was reelected um, uh, to a second term, he, he asked if we could do it again, and we did it once again at at, uh, at Occidental under the auspices of the what had then become known as the Third LA program that I was directing at Oxy. Um, and in that conversation, we talked about a number of things which are, I think, relevant to this question. Um, one is that although the mayor is term limited, like all LA mayors, because of the change in the electoral calendar, a one-time shift that aligned um, municipal elections with congressional and national elections. His second term has an extra 18 months. So it was instead of four years, it was more than, it was about five and a half years. And that meant um, in addition to his first term would leave him in office close to a decade at a moment of really significant transition in Los Angeles. And so I wrote a series of pieces about the opportunity that that afforded him in terms of reshaping uh, and rethinking Los Angeles and its urban form and it's uh, from the perspective of the built environment here. Um, and so in that second conversation, we really did talk about other models and other cities that had um, produced um, or created an office like a chief design officer. So there is one in Helsinki. There was a, an urban innovations lab office in Mexico City. There are a handful of other um, cities that had this office. Some of them are based in the um, in the mayor's office, some are based elsewhere in city government. It's also important to say that we have an urban design studio that produces really great work in our planning department. And a lot of folks at the Bureau of Engineering, like Deborah Weintraub, um, uh, Gary Lee Moore, the city engineer, and others who have really promoted and supported good design. And I think the mayor was interested in a position that could amplify the work that those other departments were doing and significantly to coordinate them across departments also to be, and that's one advantage of being in the mayor's office, um, is that those departments um, uh, are coordinated by different parts of the mayor's office and there's an opportunity to think about the relationship among and between them. Um, and as that relates to planning, urban design, architecture, that sort of coordination had not been directed from the mayor's office before. So the mayor was interested in a position that might uh, look at the city with an eye toward doing some of that, with a real focus um, uh, on the public realm, public right of way, as Los Angeles makes real investments um, in, at a regional and city scale in uh, mobility, uh, in thinking about climate change and our version of the Green New Deal, in looking ahead to the Olympics, et cetera. There's really an un unprecedented level of public investment. The river is also part of that and housing is really part of that too. So the brief is really to be in essence, a kind of voice for quality across all the work that the city is doing as it relates to architecture and urban design. Um, and in practice that has meant looking um, at a lot of initiatives uh, in the public realm, the public right of way, we've just wrapped up a design composition for a new standard street light for the city of Los Angeles. Um, I am working uh, on a major initiative uh, called the, the Mayor's Office Civic Memory Working Group, which is really connected to an extent to the national conversation about monuments and memorials, uh, but really trying to embed again that conversation locally here and thinking about how in our public design work we can be more productively and forthrightly engaged in the history of the city. And I think Destination Crenshaw and some other recent initiatives are examples of the, of the city trying to do that. Um, um, and in the case of Destination Crenshaw, quite successfully in my view. But in Los Angeles, you know, which has sort of styled itself as the city of the future, we've had, um, to put it mildly, a peculiar relationship with the past. And to put it more frankly, we have whitewashed and buried uh, a lot of the more fraught uh, moments of our past. So that group was support from the Getty Foundation, which includes now more than 50 architects, historians, writers, scholars, students of Los Angeles history, uh, will produce a report 
with a series of very specific recommendations about how the city can be more productively engaged with civic memory in its own past um, by the end of the year, November, December of this year. Um, and then the uh, housing, housing initiatives I've been involved in, uh, in addition to the one I just described, we are working on a new standard plan for accessory dwelling units, so kind of design pre-approval program. Uh, a, num a number of cities on the West Coast are pursuing something similar. Uh, that's in collaboration with uh, the Department of Building Safety, um, LADBS, um, to produce um, a kind of website of pre-approved designs that homeowners can go to um, and both choose to work with an architect and have some guarantee of a streamlined process. There has been at least a sense, I think, among some homeowners who are interested in ADUs that they have to choose one or another. So that standard plan uh, process with LADBS has also been quite um, productive. There are a number of other things that we're engaged in um, in the in the housing uh, category. Working on there was a, an RFP for innovation uh, through in permanent supportive housing through Measure Triple H, and I brought together a group to 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 analyze those proposals from a design point of view. A number of other things, but it it strikes me that this conversation about the future of single family and low rise zones is, is, is some ways, I, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it an existential question, but it is a fundamental question for Los Angeles. And so it is one that's preoccupied me since I started the, um, uh, started working in city hall in the mayor's office. Well, you've been very busy, that is, that's clear. It, uh, with respect to, you mentioned something about uh, the building department uh, and dealing with LADBS. We have a question here. Um, uh, the question is adding density to the traditional 50 by 100 single family is potent. I've seen many great small lot subdivision designs, but planning entitlements are so onerous that developers have abandoned their plans, even good ones. How can planning become an advocate? Yeah, that's a great question. And it also reminds me that, um, that something that I have perhaps left unsaid is is how this will inform the work on the city side going forward. So I've talked a lot about how this is sort of helping to, we hope, move forward a kind of citywide conversation. There's also some specific ways in which um, we, we think it will inform city policy going forward. So not only this larger research initiative we're doing in the mayor's office, not only work with my colleagues in the mayor's office and other parts of the city family that work on housing policy, but also in the plan, the specific case of the planning department, the housing element, which is being rethought, of the community plans, which are all being redone across the city. All of those in some ways have been, um, that they have at their core some fundamental and often unasked questions about these low rise neighborhoods. And I think you can go back to planning documents, you know, that are now 40 and 50 years and see this reluctance to take on this question for all kinds of really good political reasons, of course, because there hasn't been a political incentive uh, for elected officials necessarily to wade into this territory because you're talking about building a constituency for future residents of a neighborhood, right? And that's a really tricky calculus for an elected official if we're being frank about it. Um, but I was very struck when I participated in a symposium on the history of the center, so-called centers plan. So many of you will be familiar with this. Uh, it's a famous plan in, in, um, in planning history in Los Angeles. Uh, was begun in the late 1960s and, and uh, formally produced in the early 1970s. It was the first planning document to enshrine this idea of a polycentric Los Angeles. Um, and I was struck going back to read it again in preparation for that symposium, which was held at the Huntington Library a year or so ago, that that document tipped us right up to the edge of this conversation even 50 years ago and sort of declines to, to, to take that next step, which is to say there is throughout that document a series of sections meant to reassure neighborhoods that that territory will be off limits in terms of um, change. Um, and that has been, of course, the kind of status quo. And I think what we've realized is, A, that that status quo is not sustainable as a model for the 21st century, and B, that the conversations about how we might change it have been really limited and not as productive, not as wide ranging, not as sensitive to neighborhood anxiety as they might be. Um, so the specific answer is that we will um, invite um, representatives from these departments to sit in on the listening sessions. We will invite them to join the jury for this design challenge. 
and we will take the results uh, when we produce them in a, in a publication we will flesh out those results with essays and roundtable discussions and produce a kind of a book about a report about what we found. Uh, and we hope that those conversations, again, will continue to um, uh, inform the ongoing policy work that's happening um, at the Department of City Planning and elsewhere in the city. Great. Uh, thanks, Christopher. The, the, the next question um, I want to ask you about, I mean, and it, I think part of the, when I, my understanding of the mission of, of your position is also to be kind of a link and a facilitator between the design community and the public, right? And somehow much so. begin to sort of bridge that gap, which sometimes seems so, so big and particularly, and sometimes it's sort of a, you know, we wonder about that as sort of a cultural value, right? Uh, one of the questions here is, um, uh, from one of our participants, is there a concerted and conscious effort to engage neighborhood councils into this conversation? As mentioned by Alex above, densification development projects in general, especially small lots, get very, very contentious even at the neighborhood council level and frankly become almost impossible to navigate and convince the communities about how density and good density, appropriate density, is in fact a good thing. Like how do you cross that? How do you bridge so, that? Yeah, the short answer is yes, neighborhood councils are involved and in, in particular they're involved in the sustainability conversation. So that will be in partnership with the Neighborhood Council Sustainability Alliance um, and that will be um, moderated, facilitated by my colleague Dominique Cargraves who works in our Office of Sustainability in the Mayor's Office. Uh, but again, this is credit to my colleague Alejandro Gonzalez who has put together I think a really wide-ranging um, group of uh, uh, a collection of conversations and, and it does include groups working at that kind of grassroots and community level in a whole bunch of ways including very much so the neighborhood councils as a means of facilitating it and I would agree with the premise of the question which is that uh, these are contentious conversations we don't um, we are not naive about that um, we think they're still important we think it's important how you frame the conversation and we think there have been too many conversations that began with, what do you think about a four-story building next to you that might be enabled by SB 20, SB, you know, 50, SB 50 or a, the, the other version, SB 27. And of course people say, I, I'm terrified of that. Many, most people say I would hate that. Rather than saying, and where we hope to begin the conversation, how would you like to see your neighborhood evolve over the next generation? What are the things that your neighborhood, that housing does well in your neighborhood? What are the things that it doesn't do well? What are the things that um, some change and some new typologies might enable? What are the, the, the things you would like your neighborhood to make room for? Who are the people you would like your neighborhood to make room for, et cetera? Um, and really start the conversation there rather than a reactive conversation to the latest legislation coming out, of, uh, coming out of Sacramento. To the first part of your question about facilitating, I think that has everything to do with why the mayor uh, thought to appoint an architecture critic as, an opposed, as opposed to a practicing architect to this position because that's what I did in my old job. I was translating between the world of architecture and the reading public. So it was my job to think about how to be conversant in the language of both sides of that divide, how to think about describing architectural concepts in a way that would be accessible to readers who might have an interest in architecture, uh, but not necessarily any training or, 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 or particular background in it. Uh, I think that in addition to the fact that I'm, because I'm not an architect and because I've spent my career thinking about that kind of facilitation or translation, um, I'm not trying to design the projects. I'm not seeing a project that comes to my office for some kind of oversight. I'm thinking about how I would have designed it. I'm thinking about how it might be improved. I'm thinking even more important, how to articulate how it might be improved and how to um, express the way that improvement might happen, not only to an architect, but the architect's client an applicant through the city um, to the mayor or colleagues in the mayor's office, et cetera. Uh, and that's what I've spent my career doing is thinking about uh, and working on the language of that kind of translation or, or facilitation. Um, and I think, um, and the mayor has said as much that that was, um, I, I think that he wanted the position to do that. And I think of this kind of engagement, I think as being a significant part of what I'm doing. So he was very interested in that. 
I'm very interested in that. This city is changing and faces so many basic fundamental questions about what kind of place it wants to be in the next generation. Far more um, uh, uh, significant questions along those lines than any other American city that I can think of, with the exception of those that are in, in the direct path of climate change, like Miami or Houston. Um, but compared to a city like uh, New York or Chicago, where so much is fixed, um, so much in Los Angeles in terms of civic identity is up for grabs. We need these platforms for conversation about the future of the city. We have traditionally lacked them, so I'm really grateful to AIA and its committees for providing those. I was talking to Dana Cuff today, who runs City Lab at UCLA. She's done a fantastic job of producing, providing one of those platforms. But you know, we don't have an equivalent of Spur in San Francisco. We don't have an equivalent of the Graham Foundation or Van Allen or Regional Planets. So we don't have these kind of groups to talk um, as consistently over many decades about the kind of city and region we want to have. Um, and again, we need those conversations more um, acutely than any other American city that I can think of at the moment. And so that's a significant and will continue to be a significant part of the job as well. Great, thank you. Um, there, here, we have a couple of questions um, that I, I think they're related. I think maybe I can ask them together. And by the way, Chris, Christopher, if you're like, hey, I'm tapped out, let me know. No, no, no. Yeah, okay. um, uh, one of the questions is, what kind of language will you include in your brief about the plantings and trees? And then it follows with, I listened with real interest to your statements about the temperatures that affect different neighborhoods, which is fascinating, frankly. And it seems that each design brief must insist on long-term plantings, trees particularly, because trees reduce heat, reduce pollution, reduce noise pollution from freeways and major roads. They are able to transform neighborhoods from hot, dirty, poor, to cooler, quieter, cleaner, less dry. There's another related question. Uh, it seems that denser housing will put a, a different, more intense pressure on the neighboring public spaces, park streets. Has this been discussed? So I thought maybe perhaps there's a linkage between the two. Maybe you could cover those. Absolutely. Th this is um, a conversation that we, th this is a series of issues that we know we will talk about in the sustainability listening session, but I imagine will actually emerge in all of the conversations. Um, there is, we have already heard lots of um, concern that as we move, let's say as we move from two units to three or four units on a lot of the sides, the risk of giving up tree cover or landscape and its cooling um, benefits is really significant. That is even more the case in Los Angeles, a city where we have relied on private residential space to make up a lot of our green space and our landscape. And that has everything to do with why the temperature in those wealthier um, neighborhoods, formerly exclusive and red line neighborhoods, is cooler because it has something to do with street trees, but it has a lot to do with residential tree cover as well. Um, so the first answer is that we will encourage and we may even require, that will depend on what we hear, that all the teams uh, include a landscape architect. I think it would be wise for all the teams in the competition to include a landscape architect. So any of you in the call who are interested in the brief and what it will say, and we certainly will share the brief when it goes live in mid-October with our AIA mailing list. and. I gave my email out and anyone who's interested in more information about this design challenge should be in direct touch with me. But any architects who are on the call uh, who are interested in entering, we would, I would encourage you to think about the landscape firms that you might team up with uh, because that is really a central question. Um, and it does have to do with open space too. We have relied on our backyards, not just for cooling, but also for uh, for open space. We didn't build one big central park in Los Angeles. We built tens of thousands of miniature central parks and backyards across the region. Not that that was a, a strategy necessarily. That was the outcome of the way that we built out the region in the second half of the 20th century. Um, and where we do have open space, it tends to be peripheral. We have significant open space, of course, at the beach and in Griffith Park, but um, it is peripheral in the region, and uh, um, there, is a, there is a clear need um, to think about uh, how to build more park space in park poor neighborhoods. So I'm very interested in this question, and this is something other cities that have been looking at similar uh, low-rise infill design competitions or policy changes have looked at. Um, 
whether, and this is a conversation that I hope will be informed and, and, and made richer by this design challenge and what we, what we hear from architects and community members, that any change in zoning might also need to be accompanied by change in the investment in neighborhood parks or whether neighborhoods could, again, pull together to think about combining lots, um, but also think about setting aside, whether it's community land trust or other models, uh, space for, um, uh, for unbuilt territory that could be park space for the community. Um, uh, whether that's carved out of public land or whether that's carved out of some new investment in, in setting aside private land for that kind of, uh, that kind of park space at a, at a micro scale within neighborhoods is, is, has really been um, central to a lot of the conversations we've been having. And I, as, I, as I mentioned, I assume it will come up in almost every one of the listening sessions as well. Great, thank you. The um, uh, question came in and I think it, it's interesting because it, it's one of these regulatory agencies that every time you see it attached to a property you might be working on, it gives you real sort of, it's a, it makes you enter into the project with real hesitation and that's the Coastal <laughs> Commission. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The question, so the question from uh, one of our participants is, uh, have been discussing with Coastal or I get presumably have you been discussing with Coastal how to expedite ADUs in coastal areas? And maybe you could expand upon that beyond ADUs to just talk about planning in general, because it's, it's, you know, it's a real, it's really, it can be extremely intimidating and could certainly, you know, a lot of people just say, forget it. I'm, <laughs> the minute they hear about it, they're like, no. Um. It's true, and I have to say, I will, I will admit that I, um, at, the, at the risk of sounding naive to this group of um, folks who have been in the trenches for, for many years, I had a sense of the relationship between Coastal Commission and housing policy. I did not realize the particulars of it um, until I started this position, and I will say particularly in terms of how Coastal Commission views parking requirements. So Coastal Commission has seen parking as part of the democratic um, access to the coast and they are loath on any property to get rid of uh, parking spaces that would give people access to the coast. Um, and it's easy to see that as odds with what we think of as a kind of environmental agenda or prerogative that should be or has been central to what the Coastal Commission does over decades, right? Um, and there are all kinds of ways in which there is a balance. Um, and I would say more generally as somebody, I grew up in California as you mentioned, you know, this is a state during my lifetime that has been shaped by these major environmental um, uh, changes at the regulatory and other levels. So CEQA um, and Coastal Commission uh, foremost among them. And I think there has been a part of the environmental left that has shaped a lot of these organizations and institutions. I would include the Sierra Club in this conversation, for example, that has seen infill development, particularly infill development near and especially quite near or along the coast um, as at odds with an environmental agenda and that protecting against that infill development, whether it's housing or something else, is part of the very mission of an organization like the Sierra Club or like the Coastal Commission. I think what we're seeing is that, that we need to modulate and we have, become to, we have begun to modulate that thinking and we have to see, and again, I think the wildfires have clarified this absolutely, we have to see infill development, particularly housing in the cooler areas of Southern California, the areas that are closer to transit as fundamental to any sustainable or green agenda. Um, and that will mean, frankly, some uncomfortable conversations about historically uh, how the Coastal Commission has seen housing, particularly multifamily infill housing development, how it has seen parking, how CEQA, for example, has become a vehicle for the opposition to infill development rather than a way of promoting uh, the kind of housing development that we now understand as green or sustainable. Um, so there has been a real um, generational shift and some very contentious arguments within environmental advocacy groups about this particular question, infill housing development in particular. So it's a, it's a highly relevant question. Um, I don't pretend that that will be an easy series of conversations. I have seen, even in the last couple of years, significant progress. We do have a prop, you know, Prop 13, I would also put on that list uh, of things from my childhood in California that might need another look. Uh, we have split law on that. We have some Prop 13 finally on the ballot this fall. It doesn't look at residential properties, but it is a start. 
it is a step, I believe, in the right direction. Um, and so um, this is part of this larger conversation about what the relationship is between environmentalist agenda, again, and infill housing development uh, close to the coast in, in, in LA. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, question from John Kaliski. John, I uh, think it makes sense to look at the typology at the scale of the lot as indicated. Does it also make sense to address, perhaps as a fifth case study, uh, uh, the issue at the scale of the neighborhood, particularly given the memory of the center's plan, which is as much an urban design typology question as it is an architectural question. I hope I read that correctly. No, excellent. And John Kliske, if you're if you're um, if you're he's, listening, he's out there. Uh, yeah, good. I will be in touch with you because I I wanted to get your thoughts about this initiative in any case, and that's a great question. Um, I would like your thoughts about all the categories, not just this one, but I really like thinking about the macro or neighborhood scale. Um, and I think it might in fact make sense to do a category that does that. Um, so that's a, that's a very smart comment. Um, it's a, we've, been, we've been thinking about that similarly in a project that I didn't mention called Pump to Plug, which is a, um, a symposium that I'm, that I'm planning in collaboration with USC and with the LA Cleantech Incubator um, and my colleagues in the sustainability office and the mayor's office for December. And that's looking at both the design of charging stations and the future of the gas station. And I mention it in this context because um, we want to look at what a gap, what a charging station should mean or basically, and I, maybe I can come back and talk with this group about it as we, once we launch that project, because it may be of interest to your, uh, your members. But um, we're looking at charging stations, what the individual design of a charging station looks like, what kind of retail or community aspects it might have, the fact that the charging station as a type is sort of malleable, um, as charging times go down, it may have to change its shape. Um, it may go away entirely once autonomous vehicles arrive because autonomous vehicle driverless vehicles can go charge themselves either at your house or somewhere else. They won't need a public facing charging station. But a second part of that, a second category in this initiative, which we're calling pump to plug, is thinking about the future of gas station sites in the aggregate. And we have been thinking about it in precisely the way that John is asking about in this term in terms of neighborhood. Um, those are, of course, diverse in their private ownership gas stations. But we're asking the question, should the city, particularly the city planning department, but also the city more broadly, have a forward looking strategy for the future of those sites as gas goes away? You know, the, the mayor just announced, we, uh, the governor just announced we will not be selling gas powered vehicles in, in the state of California past 2035. There was an article in the New York Times last week that we will see, we may see parity in price between electric and gas powered vehicles as soon as 2023. So this transition is accelerating. So I mentioned that because I want to give it a quick plug, but also uh, because we've been thinking about it in terms of this aggregate question or this macro question. And, and it, it would, I think, John, you're right, make sense to apply some similar thinking to this initiative. I like the <clears throat> giving a quick plug to the plug. <laughs> That's right. Uh, well done. Uh, the, a lot of questions are coming in here. Um, this is interesting. Uh, what about conversion of all the retail that is going to go belly up in the next 10 years? While Walk Street's deed retail, we will be losing a large amount of the existing retail. This can be converted to storefront housing. Should think about this zoning shift. So um, that, I, it's, that could be quite interesting. There's a real, well, just, I'm not, it's, it's <laughs> I'll leave this to you. Yeah, it's a great question. We, we are actively thinking about that. I have been careful in the early stages of the pandemic uh, about being, about making too many speculative guesses about the city of the future, the post-pandemic city, because I remember all of the poor predictions that we made after 9-11 about the death of the skyscraper, et cetera, et cetera, and none of which came true. So I have tried to check myself. Um, in some of that speculative thinking or in any way thinking of the pandemic as an opportunity for planners or architects. I think that language is entirely inappropriate at a time when so many people are suffering both in terms of health and economically. Having said all of that, I think it has become clear that one place where permanent shifts may happen or long-term shifts may happen as a result of the pandemic is precisely in this area that is um, potential for significantly cratering demand for office space at the citywide scale 
And so I mentioned the Urban Design Studio already. Um, we have been having conversations with the Urban Design Studio, many of which are being facilitated by Will Wright and by the chapter um, about this conversion and about whether there might be an opportunity for a kind of adaptive reuse 2.0. Um, that was the, the, um, the policy change that ushered in the residential conversion of, of downtown, for example, um, uh, with a minimum of red tape and parking requirements and really was the spark that started the conversion to residential. Uh, to downtown as a residential neighborhood. Um, so we think there's a major opportunity to think about um, the conversion and what, what the city can do to streamline and accelerate the conversion of uh, office space that lacks demand <clears throat> to housing. It's a different set of questions, a different scale, of course, from this initiative, but an, an important question related to housing policy nonetheless. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, the um, question from Will, Speaking of will, uh, will this design challenge help? Uh, will this design challenge help inform the LACP and HCID LA housing element update process and the most recent LEAP grant? We're very much hoping that there's something, uh, um, some material, some thinking, some wisdom from the communities um, that we can feed into that process that we share with our colleagues who are working directly on the housing element um, and in the community plan updates, as I mentioned. Um, I think, again, credit to Alejandro for the breadth of these conversations. I can't think of a, a similar set of housing policy conversations that has engaged uh, as wide-ranging a group in such a short amount of time. So even for people who are not interested in entering, we think uh, these uh, sessions, which we will put in full as publicly accessible recordings on the website for the design challenge uh, will be a really useful snapshot about where this kind of, um, let's say, homeowner and renter feeling, constituent and resident feeling is as it relates to the future of housing policy in low rise neighborhoods. So let's maybe we'll do a couple more. Sure. Yeah, happy to. Are you okay with that? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, uh, let's see, uh, one, there's one here that says, we seem to always approach discuss residential properties in a myopic way. Why can't we zone mixed use small lots? Now more than ever, we need to understand that residential should no longer be thought of as a one use land use. We literally live and work in the same place. We need more land use flexibility and zoning needs to progress to encompass more uses on individual parcels. I, hmm, maybe it's just a, a comment, less, as, less, less a question. Uh, well, I think the, I think the, um, the COVID-19, um, the, the pandemic has really opened up this question and has clarified the need to rethink it in the way that, the, that this question um, suggests, which is to say, the overlap between, like, you know, I think it's there. There are all kinds of problems with the overlap between living and working. We shouldn't be too quick to totally embrace it because it also is very. It's not always um, a that division can be helpful for employer employees, and erasing that distinction can be very helpful for employers. And I think we need to keep that in mind. There's a, a reason that we have had distinctions between live and work. Um, and those in terms of mental health, in terms of childcare, in terms of equity, um, those, some of those distinctions are quite important to maintain. Nonetheless, technology and the pandemic means that these, you know, these, these uh, definite, these, these boundaries are much more fluid, of course. Um, and we do think there are ways for housing policy to reflect that fluidity. I mentioned the, the possible reintroduction of retail at a small scale back into residential neighborhoods. I think that's something that could um, that, that could gain some real support if it means that um, that we could legalize um, whether through street vending or through the actual introduction of, of storefronts in neighborhoods again or small stores in neighborhoods. You really could, you know, pass the popsicle test, which is whether you can walk and get a popsicle and get home before it melts. Um, again, connected to this notion of the 15-minute city. Um, I think a reintroduction, a smart and thoughtful reintroduction of retail um, into residential zones will be really important. 
Um, and I think there is a real diversity of opinion on this question. I think there are concerns about the, the doors that would open to development in neighborhoods, and we have to be listening to that as well. Uh, but I, I do agree with the basic premise of the, of the comment, which is that um, this, this pandemic has really, has, uh, has really reopened that as a question that architects, planners, policymakers need to be looking at carefully. I was wondering if perhaps if we could revisit, maybe this will be the last question because I think we're kind of uh, running out, but, uh, and that is sort of this notion of the competition as a tool at, at the city's disposal. And one of the things that I remember when I was uh, like in the mid eighties, I went to Berlin and I went there specifically to, to look at the buildings that were produced through their IBA, uh, which was an ent international building exhibition that was done by a variety of architects throughout the city. And I've always wondered why here in the US there never seemed to be a similar program and really what it brought, it brought, a, you know, a bunch of, it put together a lot of architects it was sponsored by the city, you know, and it brought together and, and actually executed a number of projects and they were all housing to deal with housing issues and uh, was able to sort of expose a lot of different ideas and sort of, you know, it was a great model. It goes on, it continues today in Europe. Is that something that might be looked at by LA? I mean, the, this is a smaller, this competition that you're talking about seems like a good start, but it could e expand to something that deals with a variety of different housing typologies and literally crisscross the city. So the, the, this uh, question of the culture of competitions is really, uh, is, is, I'm glad that we can <clears throat> address it. It's very, from my point of view, very, very complex. Um, we did a competition for the street light. We have chosen a new standard street light, which will be rolled out, we hope, um, within a year or so. Um, that seemed to me a really ideal vehicle. And I think the decision to, ha to do that through a competition was really uh, validated by the solution that we that we chose, which was not a team or an approach that we would have found through a conventional method. This project that I've been to this initiative I've been talking about tonight is an ideas competition. It is a way to put on the table um, a series of questions that have been politically difficult to uh, broach or engage. Um, and so we think the ideas competition is a vehicle for moving that conversation forward. And that's why we chose it for this particular thing, this particular topic. But what you're asking about is also a kind of culture of competitions within city work. And yes, we're actively looking at models um, with colleagues in other departments as well, um, uh, studying some of the competitive models and procurement models from Europe and elsewhere to really produce a culture uh, where that happens. But we have to always be mindful of the kind of exploitative potential for certain competitions. I have tried to be careful about, you know, um, attaching the right structure or thinking about the right vehicle for each initiative. Sometimes that could be a competition for an actual thing, a building or a, an object in the right of way. Sometimes it's an ideas competition. Sometimes a competition is not the right vehicle. Um, many times, the vast majority of the time it's not, in fact. Um, but this idea of a culture of competition for city projects is really what you're asking about. And that can be very, very effective. I still remember going to Medellin in Colombia where I wrote about this renaissance um, that had promoted the work of and provided a platform for the work of a number of young and mostly Colombian architects. And it was done through precisely the kind of structure that you're talking about. So every, every school, you know, they had a tighter coordination than we do between the school uh, district and the city government. Uh, there's some limitations in terms of the structure of the city and public projects that we would have to talk about in a longer version of this conversation. But nonetheless, every new school, every rec center, every small scale park, uh, was opened up to competition through uh, uh, firms that were local and had essentially been pre-approved in some way by the city. Um, so they had some guarantee of work. So it wasn't just you throw your hat in the ring, you spend all this time. It was a way in which uh, engaging with the city meant that you would have some guarantee, whether that's an on-call list or some other uh, um, a vehicle of, of getting some work from the city if you went through the whole process. And then once you were sort of on a list like that, the, the projects could be um, given out on a competitive basis, right? Uh, that that holds great a great deal of potential, and it really did explain a lot of the architectural and urban design renaissance in in, in Medellin, as in some European cities that you're mentioning. And 
Uh, we have not traditionally had a culture of doing that for public work um, in Los Angeles, so we, we, we have a lot of work to do to begin to put it in place, but we're we are actively looking at a number of those models, yes. Great, great. Well, um, Christopher, I want to thank you for your time and a great talk and, and learning a lot more about what you're doing out there. And uh, everyone's giving you, you know, they're all muted, but you can unmute if you like, everyone, and just sort of, you know. Hey, uh Tony, can I jump in for one second? Yes, I have yes, to yes, plug yes. something. I just want to point out that we're really honored to have Christopher on our board of directors, which gives me a really easy segue to remind you all that the design awards are coming up on the 20th of October. I promise you it will not be your average room, although it won't be, a, it will be different than this one. Um, and we also have Powerful, our conference put on by women in architecture. It's going to be October the um, uh, 9th and 16th with some extraordinary headliners. Billy Chen is coming to talk to us via Zoom. And the, all the headliners are having like conversations. Anne Fugaron with um, Barbara Bester, um, Billy Chen with uh, Annie Chu. And we have some really unusual, some women we don't normally hear from. It. And the last is next week we have a creative conference um, that's truly exceptional. It came on our boards late, but I think it will be a little vacation for your brain. It's in the evenings. We, um, the interiors uh, committee put it on. It has people from all over the world, and it's to help spark, you know, while we're all stuck in our little green world help spark. So thanks, Tony. Sorry I jumped in. Thank you, Christopher, for being tonight, being here tonight. Tony, back to you. I think I think Christopher uh, is already drinking wine. Oh, no, he's over here somewhere at the bottom. I'm actually sorry. My, I, I got cut off, so I had to call back in, so I apologize for that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so abruptly. Um, anyway, I, thank, thank, thank well, you so much for having me, and, and really, I encourage everybody who's on the call to be on the lookout for when we uh, put this, uh, this brief out on the website um, and really encourage everybody to, um, to think about taking part. And again, thanks so much for everybody's Chris, attention. Before you leave, Christopher, can you tell folks what uh, the website that they should be looking for, what that website address would be? Yeah, we don't have a URL yet. We should have that very shortly and we can share that as soon as we have it with, um, with AIA and hope the chapter can, and, uh, can help us in getting the word out. Okay, let's do that. Uh, so, Christopher, thanks again. Really appreciate it. That was a great talk. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for, for having joined us this evening. And please uh, be on the lookout for the next UDC event, which will be late October with Gabrielle Bullock of Perkins Will, and uh, with a focus on the Destination Crenshaw project. So have a great night.